bit chilly outside, but glory to God, it's warm in the house. Amen? So it's good to see you. Glad that you are with us this morning. Those of you watching by YouTube, we're still working on the Facebook part. Uh, uh, Facebook tells me that my new Facebook page hasn't been open long enough for me to stream online from a laptop computer. So I'm not sure how long that's going to take, but praise the Lord, we're working on it. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, just to, by way, a couple of things by way of announcement. Uh, next weekend is our Moving On in Victory weekend. Those of you who've been with us before know what that's about. We have Dr. Jeff Thompson come with us, be with us. Uh, Brother Dean Berg will be with us. And uh, we'll have a Saturday morning, 9 o'clock to about 11 o'clock. Uh, we've got a, a leadership uh, con uh, leadership teaching. So you're part of our ministry of helps. We'd encourage you to be here. If you're not part of the helps, but you want to come anyway, you're welcome. Amen. We'll have some refreshments, coffee and so forth for you uh, that time. So uh, Dr. Jeff and Brother Dean kind of take turns and they do something on leadership. And then Saturday afternoon, four o'clock, uh, Dr. Jeff will be with us. Sunday morning, Brother Dean will be with us. And then Sunday night, uh, Dr. Jeff will be with us again, but that's at six o'clock. It'll be on your bulletin, so pick one up as you walk out. Amen. And I uh, trust that you picked up an outline because you'll need it this morning as we uh, go through the message. Pastor B has an announcement. Okay, ladies. I know y'all have been waiting and, and asking, when are we going to have our next ladies Bible study on Thursday morning? Well, it's coming up. February the 1st, that Thursday, we will start meeting at 10 o'clock again on Thursday. We will be reading a book by, that Mark Hankins has written, a, a wonderful minister of God. It's called The Spirit of Faith. You want your faith to be built up this year, come join us. Uh, we will be reading that book together. And uh, so there is a sign-up sheet in the foyer. Um, the books are $10, and it's worth a lot more than that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So y'all sign up, come and join us, and we'll have a great time in the Lord. Praise Amen. the Lord. This evening, it is this evening, 4.30, 4 o'clock, the teenagers will be meeting with Miss Carla and Mr. Aaron in the youth room. And so if you have teenagers, either... Uh, <laughs> Uh, whether they be your children or grandchildren, uh, they're welcome to come. We'd love for them to be part of that. Amen. So our offering receptacle is in the back, and most of you know that by now. Those of you watching by YouTube, there should be a, a, a QR code right there for you to look at. For, Put your phone on, uh, get it with your camera, and then it takes you right to a giving portal. So we're just going to go ahead and bless our offerings. Many people have already put theirs in the, in the receptacle, as I did. Uh, others will do that as you walk out. So just say this with me. Father, this is my investment in the kingdom of heaven so that Living Glory Church can fulfill its divine ministry. Your word says that when we sow a seed, we can expect a harvest. Father, my harvest is coming in, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I will never have a bill I cannot pay. I'll never have a need that you won't meet according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. All of our bills are paid in full in Jesus' name. Amen. We started two weeks ago a, 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 a short series, and I'm not sure uh, we'll uh, take a break from it next week with the ministers coming in. Probably pick up the following week. Um, beginning of every year, uh, we endeavor to try to help people uh, understand that you can have a new beginning. Uh, you can have a fresh start. You can have... Uh, greater expectations than what you've experienced in 2023. For many people, 2023 is a year that they're glad is over with. For some, uh, it was a banner year, it's a good year. 
and yet uh, there can always be greater things ahead no matter how good things were. And so uh, the title is, is uh, Having New Expectation Thresholds. A threshold is a beginning, it's a portal, it's an opening. And so I can have greater expectations in my life. Last week we, we shared with you the importance of renewing your mind with the Word of God in order to think different than what you've been thinking. Amen? In order for me to have a, a new expectation, in order for me to have greater expectations, i got to change my thinking. And when I change my thinking, I change my talking. Uh, this morning, we're going to look at another part of this, this, this series. Uh, look at Job 22. And one of the passages, 28, says, You shall declare a thing, and it shall be established. And so that was the talking part of our uh, message last week, uh, and to make some declarations for 2024. So uh, in your outline, uh, each week will be a short declaration for you uh, for that particular message, and as the Lord leads you to continue doing that. A declaration is a statement of not necessarily something that already exists or that you already have, but also a statement of what is potential for your life, what is possible in your life. Job 22, but we're going to back up to verse 21. And, it, and, and um, when I saw this and looked at it, I went back to chapter 21 and saw some of the things that Job was saying. You remember Job had a real battle in his life. And sometimes when we have a battle in our life, we have a tendency to open our, our, our mouth and say some things that we probably shouldn't say. And Job was, was doing that. One of his friends... Elipas uh, begins to talk to him in chapter 22. And as I was reading that, I, I began to think and sense that Elipas has got a pastoral call on his life. Because he's, he's really talking to Job and, and challenging him. Challenging Job. And, and you know, Job was considered the most righteous person around. That's what God said about him in the beginning of the book of Job. He was righteous. And so, uh, but Elipas, even righteous people can sometimes have a problem with their words <laughs> and their mouth uh, when they have challenges in their life. And so, I, I want you to think about what we're reading, and we're going to expound on each each of these verses just a little bit. Um, verse 21. Now acquaint yourself with him and be at peace. Thereby good will come to you. Receive, please, instruction from his mouth and lay his words in your heart. If you return to the Almighty... You will be built up. You will remove iniquity far from your tents. Then you will lay your gold in the dust and gold of Ophir among the stones of the brook. Yes, the Almighty will be your gold and your precious silver. Then you will have your delight in the Almighty and lift up your face to God. You will make your prayer to him. He will hear you and, you, and you will pay your vows. And then verse 28. You will also decree a thing, or declare a thing, and it shall be established for you, so that your light will shine, so that light will shine on your ways. And so there's several things he's telling him in that passage of Scripture. The first thing he says, do you have a relationship with God? 
Are you acquainted with Him? You see, there's some times when we can be acquainted with someone, but yet not have a relationship with them. And He said, you, you call yourself a Christian, you call yourself a godly man, do you actually have a relationship with God? And so sometimes pastors have an opportunity or a responsibility of challenging their congregants. And sometimes we preach a shout and jump around and glorify a message and one that, you know, is, is a, 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 a motivational speak and speech and sometimes those are good. But sometimes there's a time when we've got to settle in and it's got to be a pastoral message of challenge. A couple of days ago, I was, I was waking up and you know that, that time between the time that you actually wake up and are really conscious of what's going on and, and, and then you, you, know, you, you, you drag yourself out of bed or you jump out of bed, whichever one. If you're a morning person, you jump out of bed. If you're an evening person, you just, ah, you drag yourself out of bed. You, you know who I'm talking about. I heard these words. He said, I'm looking for people with an all-in life. I said, okay, Lord, what do you mean? So I looked up the word, the term, all-in. Uh, I used to watch the World Series of Poker. Not that I ever played poker. I haven't played poker since I was probably 12, 13 years old in my grandfather's house. We more, we more played bure than we did poker. But So I got to looking at that. And to be all in is when a player has his hand in front of him and realizes that he's got one opportunity. He puts his hand down takes all of his chips, regardless of how much there's in, everything in front of him, slides it into the pot. I'm all in. It's, just, it's all or nothing. If I win, I'm rich. If I don't win, I go home. This is it. I'm, I'm all in. And so the Lord said, I'm looking for people who say, there's no reserve. I'm all in. My life is all in. My life is all yours. Because without you, I'm nothing. Without you, the little bit I have ain't enough to solve my problems. The, the, the little bit that I have, what I have it, at my disposal isn't enough for this world. My life is all in. So when I look at that and I, uh, I saw that, I went back and I looked at this verse. He, he says, uh, are you acquainted? Are you familiar with him? Are you serviceable to him? This thing is bothering me. Let me move it to the back. Are you serviceable to him? Then he says, Receive instructions from His Word. How many times has Pastor said, put the Word first place. Get into His Word. Spend time in His Word. Because they're life to everything about you. They are your life. And then He says, uh, return to Him. You know, there's some times when Although we're born again, although we're, we love God, we go off and, and we follow our own path and, and, and we find ourselves going in a direction that in our heart we know is, is, is not what God planned. We, we, we sometimes we go in a direction that's like, how do I get back to where I was? He said, if you return, the word there is, is repent. 
is simply making an, a, a change of your thoughts, but a change of your direction. He said, when, when you do that, he said, uh, you then begin to remove the sin, the wickedness, the unrighteousness out of your life. It's a matter of being in the right place. And sometimes it's not gross negligence. It's not gross sin. Sometimes it's just being outside of the perfect will that God has for you. And he says, lay your gold in the dust. And I thought, man, anybody can pick it up if I put it in the dust. And then he says, throw the, the, the stones in, in the brook. What's he saying? Don't put your trust in your bank account. Don't put your trust in your 401k. Don't put your trust in, in, in your reserve. Make it such that it, it, the King James says it is considered, uh, consider them of little worth as far as your relationship with God and His being able to take care of you. Then he says, and when you do that, when you're not looking at your reserve, not looking at your bank account, not looking at that, and you simply say, it is common, it is, it, now I'm not telling you to get rid of it all. And that's not what he's saying. Don't put your trust in it. Don't put your reliance upon what you have, what you inherited, what you've earned, what you've been able to save. I think you ought to save some. I think you ought to have a nest egg. I think you ought to have something for that, quote, proverbial rainy day. But you can't trust in it because then he says when you do that, then God becomes your gold. God becomes your silver. Your delight is in the Almighty. Your trust is in Him. And then he says, you will, you will pray and hear. Now notice, it's interesting. He didn't pray first. He didn't tell him to pray before he was acquainted. He didn't tell him to pray before he uh, trusted in God. He told him to trust in Him first. He told him to uh, uh, put his, his resources on a back burner, so to speak. He didn't tell him to receive the instruction first. Or rather, he didn't tell him to, to do that. He told him to do all of these things, and then you pray. And when you pray, he'll hear you. It, it brings me to the passage of Jeremiah 29. You know, verse, verse 11, he says, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good. They're plans that give you a hope. They're plans that give you a future. Sometimes we stop right there. But then he says in verse 12, Then you will call upon me. And when you come to me and pray to me, I will hear you and heed you. Then you will seek me with then you then you will seek me, inquire for, and require me as a very necessity, and find me when you search for me with all your heart. An all-in life is one that says, God, my heart is yours. And then we get back to Job, and once you've done all of those things, and you've prayed, and you've done those things, and you've, you've become acquainted with God, and you put His Word in your heart, and you rely upon Him and trust upon Him, then He says you can decide something, declare it, and it'll be established. You see, too often we want to declare and get it. We want to put our order at the first window and drive to the second window and get our burger and get our blessing. You see, far too many people are wanting the blessing without the obedience. Far too many people are wanting the promises without the commitment and the dedication. You see, the, 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 uh, the obedience comes first. The dedication comes first. Too many want the, the, uh, to want to make a declaration 
without establishing an all-in life. Who's quiet? So what is an all-in life? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 22, someone asked him, Lord, what's the teacher? What is the greatest commandment? Verse 37, he said, Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. I like Mark's translation of that or Mark's rendering of that. Mark chapter 12, verse 28. And he said, Jesus said, The first command, first of all the commandments is, Hear, O, o Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That has to do with our intellect, it has to do with our heart, it has to do with our emotions, it has to do with everything about us. But then he adds, with all your strength. What does that mean? It means it goes beyond just the thinking, it goes beyond just the words, it means all of our actions must be in line to be an all-in life. He says, when I do that with all my heart, my life is all in. Now what we find is that that was a quotation from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Moses wrote and he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Have you ever asked yourself why God ever had the Ten Commandments to start off with? I did a little research and you know the book of Genesis means beginning. The book of Exodus comes from a Hebrew word meaning to leave. They left Egypt. God brought them out. The book of Leviticus means to the Levites. But it's a, an expounding of the law. And then the book of Numbers means census. God wanted to know how many folks are out there. Well, he knew. He just wanted the Moses to know and Joshua to know. Have you ever thought, what does Deuteronomy mean? It means copy. A repetition of the law. So Moses wrote that, put it down. But why did God give them the law? I'm not sure that this is the exact reason. But from the time that Jacob went into Egypt, to the time that Moses got him out, 430 years had transpired. Think about that. 430 years. Now, some say a generation is 40 years. Some write a generation is 20 to 30 years because that's the time that uh, uh, men and women are having their children in the 20s and 30s. So it's 20 to 30 years. Sometimes they look at a generation as to the average lifespan of a, uh, in, that re in that area. And so when I, I did some numbers, it was anywhere between 6 and 20 generations had been in slavery. So think about this. How many of you know your great, 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 great Grandfather. Anybody? How many of you have ever met them? I mean, I knew my grandfather on one side, but not my great-grandfather. Now, in some cases, if you're young, you might still have a great-great-grandfather. 
Why am I saying that? Because for 430 years, they lived in slavery. They were told when to get up, what to eat, when to work, when to go to bed, how many children they could have. They were, their lives were completely controlled. Every avenue, every minute of their day was controlled. Now, think about it from this perspective. 430 years would be the year 1593 if we subtract 430 years from 2023 or 2024. And if you imagine what was the condition of the United States in 1593? So God knew, now watch this, that if he set two to three million people loose with no direction, with, with, with no controls, with no foundation for life, they would scatter and there would not be a nation. They would not know how to treat one another other than the way they were treated as slaves. They would not know what was right from wrong other than what they learned in Egypt. So God gave them, and somebody looks at the Ten Commandments and says, that's all, God just don't want us to have no fun. He just said, Man, don't do this and don't do that. Put on my Cajun accent once in a while, you know. See, God understood that without some balance and some controls, they would get into stuff that would be devastating and, and damaging and, and, and would, would probably dissolve the lineage of Jesus. And you know, sometimes, you know, our parents gave us some rules and regulations. Why? Because they'd been down the road a little bit. And they knew that without rules and regulations, uh, we might get into stuff we would not be wanting to, get, don't know how to get out of. And God was really giving them the law as a method of protection, as a system of life, so that he could be their God. It wasn't necessarily a matter that he didn't want them to have fun. It wasn't a matter that he didn't want them to have life. But what he was understanding and trying to get them to, un to see is that when we put him first and we live according to his rules, according to his standard, according to his uh, conditions, we not only have life, we will have a great life. Deuteronomy chapter 10. Verse 12, he says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? That require, word require means to ask, to inquire, or to demand. He said this, he gives them four things. But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, to love Him, and to serve Him. Now notice, with all your heart, all your soul, and to keep his commandments of the Lord and, and his statutes, which I command you today for, now notice the last three words, for your good. In other words, God didn't give them the commandment to hurt them. God didn't give us the word to, 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 to hurt us. He gave us the word for our good. And if we can ever get that into our sink, sink into our mind, that when I go all in with him, then he is going to do something. He wants to do something good for me. Notice he said, I want you to reverence me. 
We live in a world that does not reverence God. We live in a world that's getting darker and darker, further and further from God. He said, I want you to walk in my ways. Follow him. Uh, and live your life for him. It's, it, 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 it's what he's saying. And in love, have some affection for him. You see, it's one thing to come to church out of a religious organ, out of a religious mind and a thought, I, I, I got to go to church, I got to go to church, or I go to church because I want to go to church. And, I, I, and I'm like, David, I rejoice when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. You see, church should not be the place we go just because we have nothing else to do. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> it ought to be the place that we want to be there. Why? I want to go and, and, and show my affection for God. I want to go and, and, and worship Him. I want to go and let Him speak into my life. And then He said, serve Him. That word service means to worship. But it also means to give him the worship which he requires, performing it with all our heart. But that word service has a root word that another word from it is a bond servant. A bond servant. A bond servant is a volunteer, voluntary servant. One who has the right to be free and do whatever they want to do. God created you and I with a free will and we can do whatever we want to do. Live however we want to live. That's what he's, that's what he's given us. But when I say, God, I made Jesus the Lord of my life. And, and, and God, I'm going to lay down all those things I could do. And I'm going to serve you. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to be all in for you. It's, it, it, it's a bond servant. In Jesus' day, it was not uncommon for someone who was struggling to feed his family, struggling in his life, struggling with his job, struggling for whatever. And he would attach himself and he would go to a wealthy landowner and say, listen, if you provide me with some food and some covering and some, a place to live, I will serve you. I'll work in your fields. I will slop your hogs. I will tend your sheep. I will do whatever it is you need me to do. I will indebt myself to you. I am your bond servant. You see, in the, in, in, uh, the Jewish law, there was a, a year of Jubilee. And when someone had indebted themselves in that way, and the 50th year of the year of Jubilee, he could go free. His, his debt was paid. And he could go. It's interesting because it could also happen in the seven year cycle. That he could go free in seven years. But it does say this, that if the servant decided that, hey, man, I got it, I got it gooder here than I did out there. That's not proper English. You, you understand. But I'm trying to wake you up. Just be sure you're listening. I got it better here than I did on my own. I want to stay and be your servant. He said, I want to say, okay. Come with me. So they go to the doorway. And they take a, what's called an owl, A-W-L. He take his right ear put it against the doorpost and nail it to the door. 
and then he can never go free. He was bond for his life. Now he didn't stay he didn't stay stuck to the door. You, you understand that. But 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 they took him out, and so he had a lasting reminder that he was a bond servant. You see, I believe Paul, when he wrote to, to the book of Romans, and he said in Romans chapter 1, Paul, a bond servant to God, to Jesus, to our Lord. He's, he's simply saying, I could live the way I want to live, but I choose to voluntarily be a servant to God Almighty. Philippians chapter 2 says Jesus was a bondservant to the Father. James and Peter and Jude all call themselves bondservants. Paul called the pastor at the Colossian church, Epaphras, a bondservant. And so what am I saying? I believe that when we make a decision, I'm going all in for God. I'm going all in. My life is all in. I am, then I become a bond servant. It does two things. It says this, I am going to humble myself enough so that God is my leader. God is my king. God is my Lord. Jesus is my big brother. The Holy Spirit lives in me, directs me, guides me, helps me. I am all in in my life or my life is all in it humbles me it puts me in a humble place puts us in that humble place but I believe when Paul was saying that he was going one step further and that it was an honor and a dignity to be a bond servant that God chose him doesn't the Bible say that God chose you chose each one of us and so it's not just humbling it's not just a, a, a matter of putting ourselves down it's a place of dignity in the kingdom of heaven that God chose us to be bond servants worthy to be his ministers worthy to be his worshipers it's interesting that Jesus made a statement in Matthew chapter 15 verse 7 he's not talking to the world he's not talking to the drug addicts he's not talking to the alcoholics he's not talking to the perverse people he's not talking to the wicked he says hypocrites well did Isaiah prophesy about you saying these people draw near to me with their mouth honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me and in vain do they worship me teaching as doctrines the commandments of men who sounds like religion to me that they go to church as fire insurance I don't want to burn so I better be in church I'm gonna worship God but all the time I'm worshiping worshiping God I got other plans going on inside and, and, and so I, I worship him on Sunday and I give him his time but Monday through Saturday is party time for me. And I'm going to live my life the way I want to live my life. Jesus called those folks hypocrites. Woohoo! Fun, fun. Towards the end of the book of Deuteronomy, verse chapter 26. Moses wrote, said, This day the Lord your God commands you to observe these statutes and judgments. Therefore, you shall be careful to observe them with all your heart and with all your soul. Verse 17, he says, Today 
you have proclaimed the Lord to be your God. The day you got born again, the day you came and asked Jesus into your heart, is that day you proclaim the Lord as your God. You proclaim Jesus as your Savior and as your Lord. And then he says this, and he says, and you, uh, th then, then, he, then he goes on, he says, you proclaim the Lord to be your God and that you will walk in his ways and keep his statutes, his commandments and his judgments and that you will obey his voice. That's what we said. We may have just said, Lord, come into my life. But what God heard was, I'm giving you my life. I'm all in. That was our proclamation. And then verse 18, he says, Also today the Lord has proclaimed you to be his special people. Woo now, you know, when we talk about somebody that's special, they're special. God looked at you. You know, I, I look at myself and I'm, I'm nothing special. Not in my own eyes. Maybe not even in anybody else's eyes. But God looks at you and your uniqueness and who you are. You're special. Patrick, you're special. God proclaimed it. Miss Jerry, you're special. I could call each one of you by name. Say, so you're special. Just as he promised you that he would, that you should keep all of his commandments and that he will set you high above all the nations which he has made in praise, in name, and in honor, and that you may be a holy people to the Lord, just as he spoke. You know, sometimes we look at that, and he's talking about the nation of Israel, certainly, but there's a double reference there. He's also talking about the church. He's also talking about those who have become his people by adoption, not necessarily by birth. You are his special chosen people. There's several other places in the scriptures. We're not going to take time to go through each one of them, but they're in your outline. We'll just read a couple of them. Uh, simply like this, with all your heart, Proverbs chapter 3 said we should trust him. With all our heart, Joel, Joel chapter 2 verse 12 said, we should repent. With all our heart, uh, Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 14 says, we should rejoice or praise. And in Acts chapter 8 verse 17 says that we ought to believe with all our heart. And so when we look at that and think about it just a little bit, does that put a little different picture on, on Psalm 37 verse 4 when it says, delight yourself in the Lord. <laughs> you see, when I put my life all in, I'm delighting myself in Him. I'm trusting in Him. I'm rejoicing in Him. I'm giving Him all the, the, the leeway in my life. I'm opening up every door to my life and saying, I'm all in. And he says he'll give you the desires of your heart. Listen, an all-in life doesn't guarantee that we won't have trouble. Won't guarantee we won't have some tribulation. And for those of you who speak a little French, don't guarantee you won't have some traka. <laughs> but what it does mean is that in the middle of the trouble, in the middle of the tribulation, in the middle of the Taka, you will have a strength that's beyond your own. 
you will have someone right by your side, right on the inside of you. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. You have someone that will always be right there with you, that will strengthen you, that will equip you, that will make you and help you carry through this thing. Because sometimes the, the battle may last seemingly forever, but you know what? It's still a short period of time. And sometimes we can get through that battle just that quick. Sometimes it takes time, but we're never alone in that battle when our life is all in. But if I've got some reservation, then God said, okay, hard head, do it your way. Our life is all in. Deuteronomy 28, and, and, and this just got the reference in your, in your outline. We're going to read just a couple of verses there, but I think it would be really good for you to take some time this afternoon, this week, and go to Deuteronomy 28 and see what the benefits and the blessings are of an all-in life. And then you continue to read from verse 15 to 64 and you find out the curses of a life that's not all in. An all in life is more better. Much better. Verse 1, and we're just going to read a couple of verses. Now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all these commands which I command you today that your Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. If I live my life all in, I'm going to listen, I'm going to obey, I'm going to walk as closely as I can. And when I miss it, I'm going to repent and I'm going to confess it and I'm going to get back into relationship with the Lord. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. And blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in Karen Crow. No, that's his country. You, you, you understand. Or wherever you live. Maybe you live in parks. Maybe you live in Sunset. Maybe you live in Opelousas. We got some people that are watching probably live in Panama City, Florida. Tampa, Florida. And so wherever they are, God says you'll be blessed in the city. And he said, blessed shall be your fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, the increase of your herd, the increase of your cattle. I don't have any cattle, Lord, but you know, everything you put your hands to will be blessed. And the offspring of your flocks. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. What is that? God says, I'm looking for reasons to bless you. And I will bless an all-in life. You can continue to read that at home. Deuteronomy 20, I'm sorry, um, Job 22:28. And he said, the Amplified says, and you will decide a thing. And you will decree a thing. And it will be established. And so, uh, this morning, I can't decide for you. I can only decide for me. I can't even decide for Pastor B. we can all make that decision together to live my life all in in 2024 to make that life that God intends for me to live and to open up that door a great great word this morning before the service open up our heart open up every avenue of our life and you know, an all-in life, a bondservant life, is, is not necessarily a five-fold ministry life. 
Because God calls us to be his light in every place that we are. Causes us to be ministers of reconciliation. Causes us to be his light. Causes, calls us to be the, 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 the light of the good news in your neighborhood, in your family, in your place of employment, wherever it is. And he anoints you to be just that. Whether you work in a bank or you work as a janitor, you work as insurance, or, you, or, or even if you're retired. God wants your life to be all in and equips you to do where you are at this season in your life. And so how does that work? It simply works when I get up in the morning. When we get up in the morning, we simply say, God, lead me today. I want to be, I want to, I want to follow your plan today. And it may mean that I've got to go do eight hours of work at a, at a store or go do eight hour, uh, hours of work at a bank or at, a, at an office or, or, or whatever it is. But then in that day, you simply uh, constantly saying, God, thank you. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for helping me. Thank you for helping me be the best banker I can be, the best janitor I can be, the best teacher I can be, the best... Retiree I can be. Thank you for make, helping me be the best that I can be. And in the evening, Father, I thank you that you led me today. And I give you all the glory. I give you all the thanks for where I was today. I hope I was the light into someone's life. So we declare our love, declare our life to be all in with the Lord. And so right on the bottom of your page, of your outline, those of you watching by YouTube, if you'd like to get some of these outlines, just text me or, or, or leave a message on the YouTube. I will check them and I will send them to you. Leave me your, your email address and I can get it to you. So our declaration for today, and I'd like for you to just say this with me. Father, I declare to you that I have decided to go all in in 2024. I declare my love for you. I declare I will reverence you. Follow your instructions for my life and live for you. You are my God. I am your servant. Father, I declare my life is not my own. I put my trust in you. I rejoice in you. I believe in you. I delight in you. Father, I endeavor to put iniquity out of my life. And when I miss it, I will confess and repent. I declare your blessings will come upon me and overtake me in 2024. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Father. I look across the congregation. I don't believe there's anybody here that has not made Jesus the Lord of their life. But perhaps if you haven't, or you say, Pastor, I need you to pray for me, then I want you to lift your hands. I'll pray with you. You say, Pastor, I've kind of done my own thing and I'm, I'm here and I want to get back into the, to the kingdom. I want to go all in in my life. And you want me to pray for you just for that moral support. I'll be glad to do that right after service. Uh, you can come up and make your way to the front and we'll do that. Otherwise, just be blessed. Have a great day. We'll invoke a blessing in just a minute and let you, let you go. Father, we just invoke the blessing on, uh, of the Lord upon you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord's countenance rise before you and make your way peaceful in Jesus' name. We love you and uh, be blessed today. 
If you need uh, to, if you need prayer, don't hesitate. Come on up. I'll be glad to pray with you. Pastor B will make her way to the foyer and shake your hand, hug your neck. And if no one comes, then I'll join her there. Amen. Be blessed. Have a good day.